Why are you here, Peter? I'm here to save your world. But what are you hoping to achieve by playing this game? I genuinely can help make things better here. So, why are you here? I killed my television. Jefferson, I think she might be a killer. What? Not like everybody else in here. We're different. Kind. Kind. You protect others, but you don't protect yourself. But you've just interviewed him for four hours. Do you think he's capable of murder? Listen, pal, you wouldn't think Rose West was capable of murder, but look what that bitch did. You're leaving, aren't you? I have to. They don't, they don't believe me either. I have to leave. Please, please take me with you. You beat me. Really, really beat me. Then you raped me. Who are you? My name is Peter, and I live on Astra Kalem. I was pitching it in LA, in LA, um, and I was with my brother Keith, who's also a writer. And he told me that there was a film called k pack coming out, which was a similar premise. So I didn't write mine. And then uh, a couple of years ago, my wife died. And my son sat me down. And he'd always loved the story. And he said, Dad, go upstairs and write the truth. Um, originally, I was supposed to be playing uh, a smaller part in the film, and then through through things happening, the, the lead actor dropped out. Totally very kindly. Oh, I dropped him out, actually. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, um, and I just thought it was a great story. And I love storytelling. Um, as an actor, it's a great privilege to be able to tell a good story and, um, and be part of that. The moment we first meet him, really, is Frank so much harder to listen to and thinking about it. So it's a joy to be a part of And what was he like to work with? What do you uh, a nightmare, absolute nightmare. <laughs> no, he's, uh, he's absolutely great. He's a real, real professional. We, that's what we like. Because any money that's gone into it, um, I put in myself. Um, I actually sold my house last year and bought another one, which uh, has freed up some money for me to put it into festivals and stuff. Um, but this isn't. Um, a vanity project or an ego project it's because I was in a pretty bad place at the time and in a sense it was my salvation and I'd had three or four other films made here in America um, and in South Africa and I, I didn't like what people had done to them so I've said to other writers over the years, if you don't like it, do something about it. And so I took my own advice and decided the only way I was going to get the story told as it was on the paper <clears throat> was to do it myself. So things like, you know, dressing of the rooms I did myself before the actors got there um, with Matt, my partner, who is a fantastic DOP. Um, uh, and he's, he's actually the composer as well, and <coughs> other things, he was brilliant. And basically, everybody's telling me that you've got to have 
an AD, a second AD, a three AD, you know, third AD, um, a, a, a gaffer, a this, a that. And on h half of the days, there's just me and Matt. But you cannot see the joints. Um, it took a long time. We lost six months because of the storms, just to get that last scene in, um, which was a nightmare. Um, the scene in the bedroom, when that guy that was playing the stepfather's Billy Hayes of Midnight Express fame, he, he filmed his part, you won't believe this, but 14 months before the part in the car when she's taking off the makeup. So um, you can't see the joints, you know, and it, it, it's, it's just a joy in the end to do. It was hard. I get often asked how much was the budget and this, that, and the other. And whenever I say the two words, it was hard work, nobody wants to know. They just don't want to know. Once you get to that point. Sorry? How long did it take altogether to do that? 14, 15 months wow. to film. Because this is one of the reasons that um, I dropped the lead actor out. You know, he needed it to be done in the standard 28 days type of thing. And I started to get problems, and I just knew it wasn't going to be done. And having not the money of other people, it was just a case of being patient. And we had like 30 cast members, and you may have seen in the backdrop of the Mental Institute, there's a, a wonderful organization called the WOW Group, who are mentally handicapped drama group and Down Syndrome and they came um, as our extras and they were just amazing to work with and in fact in many cases less problems than the actors. <laughs> um, so it, 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 was, uh, it was hard and I, I'm not going to pretend it was, it was always fun because it wasn't um, uh, but I'm glad I did it and I just want everybody to be proud of it. What do you hope the audiences get from the film? I was going to say, I hope you hope that they enjoy it, but, but given some of the, the content, that's a kind of a weird concept to kick around, the idea of enjoy, isn't it, but when you're talking about sexual abuse and stuff. Um, but yeah, connect with something that um, is, I know, I know it's got the, the, the idea of the spaceman and the appearance of Christ at the end, but it's quite, you know, whatever anybody you know, thinks about that kind of thing, whatever people's beliefs are, I think it's still a very human story. And, you know, uh, it's a kind of story about triumph over adversity, I suppose, which, in a, in a way, is um, a kind of story of the making of the film, from what Tony brought to me. So, you know, so, I don't know. I, I guess for the audiences, it's whatever they, they get out of it. Really, but yeah, that's what it resonates. I, I always sit in the back when we do screenings, and I heard the laughter, little bits of laughter in the right places, and the, and I hope that when, you know, you see him duck under and he gives her the dressing gown, and then you see him digging, I really hope that every one of you said to yourself, bastard, because <laughs> you thought he was, because he was no, going, no, no. and oh, that, no. you know, and it, it's it's strange. The, the beating scenes, I never allow anybody to see them. Um, when Denny gets uh, hung, there's no need for it. You know, you can do things um, and let the imagination run wild. But different people see different things in it. Sorry about, the, you talk about the truth in it a lot, different versions of the truth. Mm, yeah. And then each of us carrying our own quiet little truth. Yeah. And then you put this great massive big one on the top saying, Whatever yours is, there's someone else's, it's much wilder. Um, yeah, yeah, and you know, easy being locked away because, a, a, you know, a father was this powerful man. Uh, and the guy that played in Billy Hayes from Midnight Express, you know, I thought he was chilling. You know, he just, he scared me, and I was, you know, behind the camera. Um, but, you know, there's stories in there that I, I witnessed, and, and the interesting thing for me as well was, Two, just before two Christmases ago, David Cameron sacked his porn czar for putting his hand in the cookie jar. 
So I predicted that. Um, and we've seen so much stuff in, in the, the newspapers and the news about the violence that can happen in hospitals and care homes and everything else. I wanted to get it across that they're not all bad. They were all frightened of her. One woman, you know, just got everybody terrified. And then to see that she's actually the one that's killed the two girls from care at the end, you know, is, is another little twist but it was her violence and her being part of the care system, she can go in and nip people out, it is also frightening, you know, as a nurse, what she could do. But it's not attacking nurses per se, it's just that what I witnessed a particular nurse doing, it, everybody else was going along with it because they were also terrified of her. You know, so sometimes it's circumstance. How did you ensure that you didn't make Peter too out there and you had to sort of have some semblance in normality and reality? Yeah, I think we spent a lot of time talking about, about Peter and, and the how gentleness of him. Yeah. yeah, and how Tony saw him. And I think in films, even with big massive budgets, audience, is what they can connect with these human relationships. Mm. And, and I think that's how we, we just played it. As, as normal human split player and that scene at the end I remember Tony uh, talking to, to myself and John and actually it wasn't kind of Christ and, and his son it was just a, a father and his son mm -hmm. and that, yeah. that was it and that's how we kind of played it all the way through I think it was just it was more about human relationships yeah. than anything else when John turned up to play it the part um, I left them all to talk uh, Peter, Simon, Simon and, <laughs> Simon and <laughs> Izzy, and I, I left them to get to know each other, and I, I was listening as I was setting up the camp, and um, I could hear what was going on, and I asked John to come for a walk with me in the woods, and I, I just said to him, who do you think you're playing tonight? And he said, Jesus. And I said, no, you're not playing Jesus, you're playing Peter's father. It's coincidental that he's Jesus. And he thought he was going to come in and do a big Jesus kind of thing. And he, he, he was brilliant because he was playing a man that was frightened that his son would end up like he did. And the scene when he's looking up at the, the crucifix and the close-up of Jesus' face is the first time his character had actually seen his dad on a crucifix, that's why it affected him so much. And they, they're all a great actors, you know. We didn't get one bad performance off anybody. But I went and sat and talked to everybody individually because I wanted it done the way it was written. Um, and it, they were brilliant. You know, I, I'll just say with Denny here, Somebody said to me, a, a film critic said to me, you could have paid um, the guy who played Bert five, you know, you could have had Tom Hanks play that and pay him five million and he wouldn't have done a better job. And his character could have paid three million for Danny. Yeah. <laughs> his character could have come over as a nasty, you know, cruel man. But the way he played it was brilliant because he's a man that was tormented. He wanted to believe he killed his television. And it's only when he talked to Peter he realises he's got to believe. He's got to, you know, understand the truth that actually he's killed his wife. And he hasn't killed her out of malice. He's killed her because he's ill, you know. With... Um, What's your name? David. Lawrence. David. Fred. No, with Lawrence. Again, we did a screening in Birmingham, and uh, one of the crew members' mother is actually um, in the mental health, and she said she had never. I mean, I'm proud of these guys. They'd never seen a doctor portrayed as well as him. The gentleness for him was that he was worried that it was too kind of one level, but it's not because he goes through all these emotions and yet he's still controlling. 
this fellow, when he said to me, he said, oh, it's, you know, it's this, this doctor is, you know, so, com and I said, no, you, you, when you see him, he's so confident in those first scenes, and he deteriorates, you know, he, he can't handle pizza. And this fella, you know, when I went to meet him over in Worcester, and I actually did more lines for him because I just knew he was going to be brilliant. And when he played Freddie, who was actually Freddie Goodwin, the, 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 the crook banker and everything else, still convinced that he can talk people into wasting their money. It was brilliant. And those, those people that didn't have the, the, as big a part of Vanessa and, you know, it was, it, it, it was just everybody came together, but it was getting them together that was the hardest part. You know, that's the, the way it worked with film. And did you give them lots of rehearsal time, or how did you, what's your Well, you'll be surprised. None. I just asked people, I would sit with people and talk to them, and we would get a kind of a feel of it, and then we would actually go through it on, on set. Simply because of, of finding, you know, time and getting people together. But also, and I, I, this is not, you know, blowing smoke up their backsides, it's because I actually trusted them and I knew they could all deliver. And the only person in the entire film I'd ever worked with before is Lawrence. So all these guys were new to me and they trusted me and I trusted them. The pr process is quite easy. You just get a shotgun, you get people out <laughs> in the mornings and you tell them if they don't do it, you know, I'll kill them. <laughs> uh, it, it, I can't explain it. I'll talk to you about it um, some other time. Um, it, it, they all know the nightmares I had. You know, these guys will tell you. But it's, it, part of it, I think, is it's what it seems to me, uh, having worked with Tony before and knowing Tony, um, but also in relation to other things, it's part of it is actually making the decision to do it. I think. Uh, um, a big stumbling block for a lot of filmmakers is the uh, lack of finance and where we've got to, where you've got to go to to, to, to get funding. Um, and so, I suppose it depends what you want to do and how you want to approach it. But the, the way that Tony approached this was um, he he didn't the way he decided that he was going to make the film, and make the film that he wanted. So obviously. Create, he, he, he'd, he'd written the script, and he uh, then sent that around to different people that he was interested in working with, and then actually, this sorry, this sounds, really, this sounds really trite, and I don't need to, but then actually just turning up um, uh, and, and using the available resource that's there, so um, working with someone really good like Matt as the DOP. He was that brilliant. Really, that, yeah. I mean, I couldn't have done it without Matt Higginbottom because, you know. Um, he can just do so many jobs, and I'm, you know, I was lucky that he was like a four, five-man crew himself. And everybody can do this. It's it's not rocket science. It's just those two words: hard work. And it, it it's how badly you want it. You know, it's how badly you want to do it. Anybody can do it. There's there's gear out there. There's people out there. There's people that are desperate to to be in films. You know, Denny is, is known for being quite a tough negotiator. Never does anything for nothing. <laughs> never does anything deferred. And I've just got to keep doing his garden for the next 28 years, and he's paid. Actually, can I ask all the cast that? How did Tony find you if I can start with you, please? I actually met Tony at a networking event, and I found out that he was doing a film, and as any actor does, you know, you're trying to hustle, trying to find work. And I went up to Tony and I was like, Tony, if anybody happens to fall ill, you know, um, and if you've got a spare role. <laughs> and he happened to have something. I, I just said, God, <laughs> can I say no to this? <laughs> you know, I said, I ain't got a role, but I'll make one for you. <laughs> No, she, she actually, I don't think she believed me. You know, I says, listen, don't talk to these people. They're going to bullshit you. I said, just give me a number, and if something comes up. And strangely enough, I wasn't supposed to be in it. When you just said about being ill, that was the, that was the part she was going to play, just that one scene. And she was supposed to say, he's cute. Now she fancied him and everything else. And that was the only one she didn't do, because she was sick. But and then I put loads of other bits in because I really thought she was great. 
And so I had to, <coughs> she did phone me at, uh, you know, four o'clock in the morning, she was being ill, <coughs> and we'd all got it set up, so I just put a shirt on, and um, I knew I had to change the lights, the lines from saying, he's cute, he's nice. You could have said that. You could have done, <laughs> and just do that, you know, he's joking. But I didn't really want it to be in it. <laughs> but that's the problem you get, you know, so. And Teddy? But yeah, I was introduced to Tony, I'd never met him before. <laughs> Hardly recognise him now, to be honest. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Simon introduced me to uh, Tony, and uh, Simon was great for getting me cast. I must say, yeah. And we just sort of hit it off, and we uh, got the same interests and uh, same passion for making films. So that was good. But he was brilliant, and he, again, because people found out that Denny was on board. This is after we've shot it. You know, they're kind of <clears> wow. <throat> you know, Denny, Denny Hodge, because Denny's been around for. Since the Shakespeare days, when Shakespeare was making <laughs> everybody knows it. <laughs> Tony just turned up at my door. <laughs> I did. <laughs> no, Simon introduced us, but it was a phone call, and the next minute it was on the motorway coming down to me, which was very flattering. Well, I'm glad I did because that, that, what I did is I did sit down with everybody individually. You know, I knew it was going to take time, so you know, you make time for other people. And I said from the offset that if this is crap, I'll put my hands up because they're all my shots. But if it's as good as it, I believe it's come out, and they believe, and I hope you believe it's come out, then it's it's a team effort because I could not do it without every single person that was there. You know, there's people here tonight that did do crewing for us. You know, you, they just turn up from miles away, and you don't even realise it. We had one young guy that was travelling a round trip of 160 miles. His mom, his dad was dropping him off in the morning. His mom was coming and picking him up in the in the afternoon, and I didn't know. I thought he was a local, and he just turned up. Brilliant. You know, he wanted to to be on a, a film set. And there's a lot of people out there that want to do that. He's since made his own films, well, hasn't he? He's made six. He's made six. So he's made six, six shorts. Six. You know, yeah. um, he, he, he was supposed to be here today, but he's been taken ill. Um, that's how you got in cat for free. Um, so, yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, well, I, uh, I, I knew Matt, I worked with Matt, who's the DOP, um, for about eight, eight years. And then, uh, he introduced me to Tony, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Tony. Tony uh, made up this story about how I, well, I had actually met him briefly before, but how I'd, I really insulted him last time I met him, and that um, he was like, "You're that guy." I was he like, came oh, into the, into the, into the, in this pub, and as he walked across to me, I just went, "You bastard! I've met you. You caused me so much grief," and he he went. Uh, and I went, oh, good reaction. <laughs> <laughs> and then that was fine. You know, I just, it, sometimes you do silly things like that just to break the ice, because he did look a little bit nervous. Because again, the shotgun was in my hand. And, you know, but he, he, in, in the part, it's really strange. These two were originally going to play the nurses. Oh, yeah. They were males. And I went to see, I st it just started playing on my, on my mind, going, yeah, you know, a man beats, but a woman, you know, beating a man and getting away with it. And then it, it all kind of changed. And he was going to be playing the gentle nurse, and he was going to be playing the brutal nurse. Um, but then I kind of changed it, and I said to, to Simon, you know what, I want you to play the lead. And I think he did a great job. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We had this conversation um, prior to the festival, but um, there was one day in the summer where, through watching the entries as they came in, I watched eight films and they were poor. And I watched your film and I thought, I hope this is going to be good. And watching it today, I, I feel vindicated because got a strong piece of work there, so many congratulations. <laughs> <laughs>
personally and, and Claire because of your, you know, some of your own experiences. You know, um, Janet, my niece here, she, she came out of the first green in um, and she was in tears. And I thought she was going to, because she's a nurse. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> was. And I thought she was going to give me a rollicking. Um, but she loved it and she's come a second time. So there you go. And she's paid. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you. Much appreciated. Thank you. Can you tell them about the, on, uh, the online series you're in? Oh, yeah, well... Which um, is playing the lead? Uh, well, I'm an officer, Mac, so I've um, recently moved to London um, because, of course, there's more work here. Um, I've been in backwards and forwards between Birmingham and London, so I'm currently doing a short film in London, sorry, in Birmingham, uh, by a very young filmmaker, I think he's only 22, and he's funded the whole the whole project himself, and he's actually paying the actors, which is amazing. And his name is Dwayne Karma for Karma Films, and the short film's called Curiosity Falls. Um, but I'm also in London working on a lead in a web series called Shrink, um, and currently in the process of filming that, so that should be live on YouTube as of the 22nd. So remember the name. The 22nd of November. So I've been very busy myself and trying to keep proactive. And I've also started my own agency as well um, for actors. Um, so I've been really like really proactive in getting myself out there and getting people that I know and I'm, and I'm very passionate about out there as well. So it's been pretty great. My only problem with. <coughs> some of the filmmakers back home is they go out for funding and unless they've got development money they, they'll write a couple of pages of a script and they won't do anything until they've got money and then they get some money for development and then they don't do anything else and you know in a nutshell that pisses me off mm -hmm. because they expect it to be laid on a plate for them and it's not it's not that easy you just got to do it yourself We change things on set. You know, I, I always had this thing with everybody, and I, I just say, um, I don't mind how you say it, I don't what, mind what you, words you use, as long as you say the same thing, as long as it means the same thing. So, they, you know, everybody had uh, a little bit of freedom, you know, um, and I think most of them use it. I know a couple of actors that will not go off the page, they want everything done. But the whole point about it was, I wanted, that's why I didn't risk anybody else's money. I wanted it as I wrote it, and thankfully everybody believed. Obviously a film can be made or, bro you know, made or broken in the edit. How much of it was in the edit, or was it pretty much as you visited it on the panel? Um, again, Matt, Matt Hickingbottom, and, and myself sat down and uh, edited it. Um, as I say, there was a big gap of all those months in, in certain scenes, and the good thing with me is because I wrote it and I directed it, I knew all the shots from both both sides. So when we're in the edit, I remembered shots that would work better. And yeah, it, it, it's it's in the edit. It, it, <laughs> get a good editor, you know, or you know, get a, a young guy that's a good editor and give him a break. But it it is a lot of it's in the edit. And sometimes you look at what you've got and you do crap yourself. You just think this is not going to cut. For instance, the the scene in the kitchen when they're making the um, fish finger sandwiches, it was okay when we were doing it, but the only time we never turned the fridges and freezers off and nobody noticed. And you couldn't hear what Vanessa was saying and the other nurse. And so we decided to just put music over it and it actually looked a better scene for it. So, in, you know, I believe anything can be fixed. I don't know, because I'm, I'm not a follower. You could name 10 directors, and I probably would only know one. Um, I'm self-taught, as you know. Um, you know, I was kicked out of school at 15, and I was in a factory two weeks later. Um, no education as such. So, if, say, if a thicko like me can do it, anybody can do it. You know, it's just like anything else. But I, I, I've got two other things, two other <coughs> projects that I'm working on. That because they are funded, or hopefully will be funded, people are saying <laughs> we've got to get a proper director in now. <laughs> and that, you know, I go, yeah, okay. So when do I get a chance again? It says. Well, if the budget's only four pence, you can do it. And if it's ten pence, we'll get a proper director in. And then they see what we've done, and that changes. Um, so to me, it doesn't matter how old it was now and the amount I've spent, because I couldn't. I could have paid 
10 times more than it cost me working with somebody else and not learned what I've learned on this myself. And as you can see, I don't know if you do realize this, I am the oldest director in the festival. So, you know, for me doing the debut, I must have been very frustrated over the last 25 years. But you say it's sort of like the perfect calling card, isn't it? Because it's something with visual that people can if see. If people like it, it is, yeah. And say, yeah, it, if it, you it, can it, pull that yeah. off with that amount of money and, you know, do it. I, can, I keep saying own. to the guys, you, you know, they've all got mm -hmm. other things. So to them, they have other things. This is my calling card because mm -hmm. it's the only thing I have. I've done other stuff. But, you know, I keep saying to, to them, you know, Simon and, and the others that you, you've got to promote it. You've got to talk about it, show them, you know, what you did. And, you know, it, it, they, there was no catering vans, there was no dressing rooms. People were all changing in the hall. I did all the cooking. <laughs> we had good, it was decent catering. Yeah, though, <laughs> yeah. yeah I, did, I, did, I did all the cooking and made all the sandwiches, did all the washing. Top of Red Bull, Red Thunder. Red. If you tell people how much you spent, especially people who are buying your film, it kills it. So keep your gob shut. Don't tell anybody. I think you're doing it the right way anyway, Tony. You're getting it into festivals, you're getting people to see it, and that's the best way to get yourself well, noticed. Well, so. you say it's getting into festivals. Yeah. A festival, <laughs> the Boff Festival. <laughs> um, Thank you for having us. The, the thing is, uh, you know, I, I'm a very honest man. I, I say it as I see it. Um, the, the, I have a problem with festivals. Um, we entered 18 and we got one. But that's but, common. That's but, common. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. But what I'm going to say is, they still, the other 17 still took, you know, the entrance fee. And you don't even get a letter or saying you're not in it. You only get when you are in it. Um, and I know um, that Emmanuel's been great for us. Um, to get it in, um, so you know. Well, that, that's the industry across the board. Yeah, basically. yeah. it's, it's there's crap. A, there's a lot of uh, <laughs> there's a lot of income streams for people that can. I don't know. I'm not knocking. I think uh, I don't know. For example, screenwriting courses, whatever. They're great that people can go there to learn. Uh, you know, I think. Um, however, there's a lot of people making money running those kind of courses. There's a lot of people making money for consultancy fees, this, that, and the other. Um, which is which is fine, and you know if that helps people, then that's a good thing. But uh, you know, big budget um, films, um, they will spend uh, a, a much greater amount on on the marketing of the film, and that gets it out to. Which is why the uh, you know our, the cinema, our cinema in this country is is dominated by the multiplexes yeah. and you know and Hollywood and stuff is because that's what people see to get out there. And it gets to go back a few years, I mentioned Shane Meadows earlier, but when he was making something like Room for Romeo Brass, you know, and he's seen as one of our, for, by many, one of our greatest directors around at the moment. Room, Room for Romeo Brass. How many cinemas did that play in the country? Six. But yeah, it was, yeah, it was a very. Small I had moment. I had one, a ten million dollar budget called Citizen Verdict, allegedly 10 million, and it was shown in six cinemas in this country. And I actually went to the one in Birmingham and told people not to go, because it was crap. <laughs> it was nothing like, a, you know, they bought off me. Everyone's a critic. I'm not, I'm, 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 I'm even a writer. I, 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 I criticise myself. Up, Tony, it was brilliant when you wrote it, and then when he was on film, it was completely different. I, I'd like to say, I mean, this. Uh, Dory's my sister. We have a brother. <laughs> we, no, no, very honest. I do really stop you see. But, but I was going to say, we, you know, we have a brother, Keith, we're both proud of. He's just shot the remake. He wrote it as a spec script, which a lot of people won't do. He sold it um, to, um, I think it's MG, I think it's MGM. Um, or Warner Brothers, one of the two, a hundred and twenty million dollar budget, a hundred and twenty million dollar budget, and seventy five million on publicity and marketing. You know, so they've got to get back. You, you know, with all the figures, of, you, hey, you have to pay funders back. 
they've got to get back 300 million before you know they wipe their noses. I've got to get 28 quid. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming.